It's Cape Chronicle. I'm Jacob McClelland. Jim McKelvey is the co-founder of Square Inc., the mobile payment processing system that makes it possible to accept credit cards on an iPhone. McKelvey now has several other startups in his hometown of St. Louis, including LaunchCode. He came to Cape Girardeau recently to talk with students at Southeast Missouri State University about entrepreneurship and to look for promising new talent. Jim McKelvey, thank you so much for coming out to talk with us. Thanks, Jacob. Happy to be here. First, let's talk a, a little bit about, uh, about Square Inc. Inc. And just kind of within the context of, of, of entrepreneurship, how does one go from that that great idea um, and then you know making it you know turn into a successful reality like this? So in in our case, it was very simple. Um, we had a real problem to solve, and the problem is uh, one that was personal to me because I was an artist uh, selling some glassware, and I couldn't take a payment, so I needed a way to take that payment. And I was uh, talking to my partner Jack um, on my iPhone. And I realized that the iPhone had all the uh, mechanics that I needed to process a payment, but it somehow didn't work. And so I said to Jack, you know, this is a problem that, that's real for me and it may be real for other people. So Jack thought that was interesting and we started uh, down the path to solve a very specific problem for one individual. And then uh, it turns out that there were millions of people like me who also needed uh, the same help. And uh, since then we've, we've grown, but, but basically it started with a very simple personal uh, problem. Now, you've had, a, you've had a, a lot of successes in your career, um, such, as, such as Square, um, but not all entrepreneurs are successful on that, on that first go-around, or on, a, on their first go-around. What, what can folks learn from those, from those um, ideas that don't quite take off and, and live up to the expectations that they had? So, I, I mean, I, yes, I think there's been success, but, you know, the success sort of gets summed up at the end. It's just failure, 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 success, <laughs> right? So if you quit after the third failure, you're going to be a failure, or not, your, your effort will be a failure. Um, so I'm an engineer by training. I think of myself as an engineer, and engineers are, are in a constant state of failure in the sense that we're always focused on what doesn't work, okay? So if it works, you ignore it, okay? This chair is not collapsing under me. I don't notice that I'm in a chair, right? If this chair was about to collapse, then I'd be worried about, you know, bracing the legs or something. Um, and so that's sort of how it is as an engineer. Uh, I spend my time focused on always, on always on problems, always on the things that are not working. And you know, even with Square, uh, you know, th there are thousands of things about Square right now uh, that I think are, you know, deserve focus. Um, and like with the other projects that I'm involved with, those two, uh, you know, it's always constantly focusing on, on fixing the stuff that doesn't work. At least that's how it looks for me. So I don't ever think of it as you know, success or failure. It's just like it's another day working. Now, as far as for, for, for startups, there's no, is there, I guess there's, there's no real, you know, one-size-fits-all recipe, I suppose, to, uh, to, 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 to start from, like, this, this brilliant idea that you have at home and then turning it into a, turning into a product that people, that, 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 that people want. Yeah, so um, th there's, there's no general recipe, I, and I think it's dangerous for anyone uh, to sort of give an answer in an interview because uh, when you're successful, okay, uh, it's, uh, it's easy to backwards rationalize. You sit there and say, oh, well, I did this and this and this. Three of those choices may have been just dumb luck, and you were the person who you know, benefited from that dumb luck, whereas you know, two of your competitors may have made equally rational decisions and failed. Um, but uh, you know, as far as general principles, I always like to look for real problems. I think problems give you a very specific focus. If you solve a problem, then uh, you don't have to ask anybody if it's good you know you just know oh this was a problem now it's not I've done something well, let's talk a little bit about um, one, one of your new projects in st. Louis called called launch code uh, t tell us a little bit about this so launch code is uh, is solving two problems simultaneously the first problem is uh, for all other companies in st. Louis and actually all over the world but certainly in my hometown uh, all of the major employers uh, and even the startups are desperate for talent they're desperate for programmers and uh, we've identified uh, well over a thousand jobs that are available right now today. Uh, and if we filled those jobs, there were probably 500,000 jobs beyond that. So it's, it's a tremendous need and all of our companies are, are facing this talent shortage. On the flip side, you have people who you know, need opportunities. And it turns out that it's not that hard to become a computer programmer. Um, I know it sounds weird to say that, but really you know, I, I became one pretty quickly. Um, and I've seen people, you know, walk the trail in, in six months and less, actually. Um, my wife is retraining. She was an attorney. Now she's a coder. She just sent me a text over, over the phone saying that she was, you know, she just wrote a new program and was really excited about it. And, and she was an attorney a couple, you know, a couple of years ago. So it's, it's, it's a very accessible field. And so what we're doing with LaunchCode is we're sort of marrying these two up. We've, we've 
uh, got over 100 employers in St. Louis and actually uh, soon to be all over the nation uh, that have agreed to take launch code apprenticeships on. And, and a launch code apprenticeship is, is a person who knows how to code but doesn't have the credentials. So they may not have a university degree. They may not be able to you know, have a good resume, but they know what they're doing. And if, if you know what you're doing, you come in for a launch code interview, we can place you at a company that will put you in a very uh, special sort of apprenticeship where they take you and they pair you up with a seasoned programmer and you work together as a team and it builds your skills very, very quickly. And the companies love it because they get new talent in very, very fast. They get them trained up very fast. And the candidates love it because it's an open door to some of the best employers in the world. Who, who are some of the companies that you're working with on this? Oh, it's, it's a blue, it's, it's everybody we've talked to. So every company <laughs> we've asked. Now, off the top of my head, Monsanto, Centene, Enterprise, Express Scripts, Build-A-Bear Workshop, SAIC, Anheuser-Busch, uh, Southwestern Bell, or SBC, or I'm sorry, they're AT&T now, AT&T. Um, I just name you know, anybody. Name and then, somebody, yeah. And then um, startups, you know, uh, Al 411, uh, you know, uh, Food Essentials, just the entire gamut. So we have not had a company yet um, that didn't want to participate with Launch Code. And, be, and, and the, the statistics are tremendous. We've placed 60 people with these companies so far, and we have a 95% higher rate. So if we place you at one of the Launch Code companies, uh, even as a junior programmer, you have a 95%, actually a little bit better than a 95% chance of being hired into a full-time position. And these are great jobs. You know, the yeah. average starting salary in, in computer science is over 80K, and at Launch Code, it's, it's like 60 and very quick uh, growth after that. How, how do people get, uh, get, get on with Launch Code if they want to, uh, if they, Just, if they want to get involved with this? It's Launch Code STL is the website, so launchcodestl.com. And uh, it's free to sign up. Um, if you know how to code, we can place you immediately. If you don't know how to code, we recommend you take a class from Harvard. Uh, Harvard has a program called CS50, which is excellent. And uh, we work with the Harvard team very closely. And uh, their curriculum is enough to get you a job. So if you pass the Harvard class, even if, even if right now you don't know how to code, but you thought, oh, you know, maybe I could, take the Harvard class. It's free. Uh, it's fun. And uh, it, uh, if, you, if you do well, <laughs> you've got 100 employers lined up. It's, it's really amazing. <laughs> now, you've, you're here in Cape Girardeau at Southeast Missouri State University. Just to you know, talk a little bit about this with, with, with students here and, to, and even to maybe even look for some, some new talent. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, what, what are you looking for? So Southeast Missouri is great. It turns out the best programmer I know on the planet, Bob Lee, went to Southeast. And I called him when I said, I'm, thinking, I'm speaking at SEMO. And he's like, oh, I wish I could be there. <laughs> like, uh, you guys have a history of producing some great talent here. And so I wanted to come down. Uh, it's, it's close enough to St. Louis that anybody who's here uh, would you know, probably be happy to take one of these jobs up in St. Louis. Uh, and um, it's just a very fertile ground. And the students here, um, what we were trying to get the students to understand was that just because you didn't declare your major as computer science you know, three years ago, uh, there's still time to learn these skills. And that you just need to learn enough that we can get you into one of these apprenticeships. You're not going to be fully trained you know, after one or two classes, but you'll be enough that we can employ you. And then once you're employed, you'll learn on the job very, very fast. And uh, bringing that message out to a bunch of students, you know, some of whom have jobs and some of whom don't, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the people who don't that we were talking to today, and there were, uh, there were a lot of them in the room. Well, let's talk a little bit about another project that you're involved in in St. Louis, which is the, uh, the Arch Grants uh, uh, program. Tell us a little bit about that. Oh, so Arch Grants is amazing. Um, it's the only program like it, I think, in the world right now. But we give $50,000 non-dilutive grants to uh, startups who are willing to move their companies to St. Louis. And it's already had uh, some very, uh, very positive effects. A uh, company that I'm super excited about right now is a company called Immunophotonics. They have a radical a cancer therapy. Hmm. Um, and literally, they probably wouldn't be in business but for the fact that Arch Grants gave them this money. And then because they were in St. Louis, we hooked them up, uh, not with just with $50,000, but we got them uh, another million and a half of investment from, from local uh, uh, VCs and, and investors. Uh, and they're off to clinical trials now, you know. And that wouldn't have happened without Arch Grants. And now they're located in St. Louis. And, you know, even if, you know, if they were successful, you know, now they're, now they're going to be successful in our town. And, uh, we just uh, reviewed uh, 30 companies uh, last week, as a matter of fact, and uh, I think 20 of them will get Arch Grants uh, this year. And it's just a great program. It's really moving the needle and, and bringing this sort of dynamic uh, startup culture you know, right here into the Midwest. Well, let's talk a little bit about that, especially here in, here in Missouri. What are some of the, what are some of the traits that, uh, 
that, uh, that we have here in Missouri that, that, that benefits startups or tech companies? And, and, and what are some things that, that Missouri, what are some of the gaps that we have here as well? So one of the things that we've got that's a huge resource is this sort of can-do attitude among the people, okay? We also, all, I think this is also good, we also tend to be a little skeptical, right? Mm -hmm. So I see, some, I, I work a lot in Silicon Valley, and there's some stuff in Silicon Valley like, you know, we're going to mine asteroids, and I'm like, <laughs> you have to sit there and, you know, <laughs> sim champagne with somebody who's, you know, telling you with a straight face he's going to mine asteroids. I know him, he's actually a good guy, he might pull it off, but <laughs> like, we tend to be um, a little more um, uh, skeptical here, and it gives us uh, a certain type of, uh, you know, cauldron on which to forge these companies. What I say is this, I say there's certain companies that will only succeed on the coasts. Okay, but if a company succeeds here, it's almost guaranteed to go worldwide because uh, if it works here, it's going to work in Peoria, it's going to work in Decatur, it's going to work in Chicago and Memphis. And, uh, you know, but if I, start a, you know, if I start a company in a very, very specific world like uh, San Francisco where they've got, you know, $15, you know, $15 creme brulee trucks, can survive in San Francisco. I don't think you can sell, you know, little dessert items for 15 bucks a piece, you know, out in Carthage, right? I just don't think it's going to work. M maybe somebody could prove me wrong, but I just think if you start a, uh, start a company in uh, a city like St. Louis and it is successful, that you instantly have something that can be validated worldwide. And we're doing this with Launch Code. Like, I had a chance to open Launch Code, you know, either in New York or San Francisco. And I was like, no, look, we're, we're going to do it here in the Midwest because that's the real proof. And uh, it's the old saying, does it play in Peoria? Um, you know, I think it applies to St. Louis and, and, and Cape as well because we have this, this opportunity to build something here. And, man, if it works, it works everywhere. Now, in addition to, uh, to, to, to all the work that we've been talking about, you've, you're also a glass blower. Yep. <laughs> tell, 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 how did, how did you, uh, how did you, how did you, how did you get into this, 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 this hobby? What made you fall in love with so this? So it's not a hobby. It's, it's a profession. I needed money. Uh, so I graduated from college. Uh, I had uh, an engineering degree, which wasn't very valuable in the job market at the time, and a uh, hobby of glass blowing. And I started a company. I wasn't earning anything with my company, so I needed income, right? So I decided, well, maybe I can sell my work. And I very quickly learned that I couldn't because it was ugly. Um, but it, it's amazing how fast you can learn a skill if, if you wake up and say, this is what I'm doing, f you know, to feed myself. And um, so I got, I got very good very fast. Um, I, I never considered myself an artist, but in fact, I make things that nobody needs. So that's art as far as I'm concerned. If you don't need it, it it's probably art. And I make a lot of stuff that people don't need uh, and have been doing so for 20 years. <laughs> We've been talking today with Jim McKelvey. Jim, thank you so much for coming out and talking. It's been pleasure. a pleasure. Thanks so much.